In the wacky world of video games, there have been countless childhood boner jams from the good old days. Too many to count, in fact. Halo, Pokemon, Bioshock, Minecraft, Luigi's Mansion, Team Fortress 2, Putt-Putt Saves the Zoo, and the list goes on. I can get down with any of these legendary Hail Marys from my past, but I've recently had the urge to delve into titles that I've missed out on. Fear, Portal, and Sama were definitely on my hit list, but a certain someone popped into my head as I was brainstorming candidates. I remembered seeing a handful of amazing YouTube videos on it, and I was instantly intrigued when my eyeballs had their first ever sampling of the game. I hopped onto the PlayStation Store to see if Rockstar Games gave the console players any love, fingers and grippers crossed, and lo and behold, there it was. Manhunt. It was originally released in 2003 on the PlayStation 2, and later on the PC and Xbox in 2004. And in true Rockstar Games fashion, it generated a slew of controversy for its extreme violence and unremorseful gameplay loop. Well, as violent and unremorseful as 2003 character models can get, but for the time, it was unbelievably revolting and irredeemable to the general public. So much so that it was banned in several countries worldwide, such as Australia, Germany, New Zealand, Malaysia, and South Korea. Yeah, it was one of those. The ones that make every douchebag that peaked in high school come out of the woodwork about how video games turn people into murderers. But still, I cannot deny that Manhunt was navigating through some tricky water. Even employees at Rockstar were uneasy about the game, and wanted nothing to do with it. Those feelings, along with the footage that you are watching right now, may be more than enough for you to think, you know, maybe they did push things too far. But in my opinion, it was perfect. Manhunt represents the Wild West era of video games that weren't afraid to take risks. Games that were more than daring enough to go against the grain, to stand out and be unique. Unlike nowadays where companies only care about their mainstream brownie points and microtransaction sales. But thank the lord that we can always go back to these masterpieces. Because titles like this have and continue to define what makes a great video game. So, gather around the dining room table as we sing happy birthday to this classic survival horror experience. On this day, November 18th, this is Manhunt, 20 years later. First of all, right off the bat, the controls did not age well, at least on consoles. Manhunt is rough around the edges, with awkward camera angles, shooting a gun on the console versions is stiffer than a board in my grandma's basement, and tank controls. Ugh. I only make an excuse for Resident Evil 4, cause, you know. It's Resident Evil 4, but obviously I'm just exaggerating, because they don't make Manhunt unplayable by any means. It's just different, and once you get the hang of it, you'll have more than enough confidence in James Earl Cash's ability to strafe bullets like the Ultra Chat he is. I'm not gonna lie though, the camera continues to remain frustrating on return playthroughs, so if you're going to play Manhunt yourself, play the PC version if you can. You may have to download a patch or two in order to get it working properly, but it's much better, not just when it comes to the camera and movement, but also the gunplay. The console version use a lock-on mechanic when you aim. When you get close enough to an enemy, the game will snap onto a hunter in your line of sight. This wouldn't be such a big deal if you could also choose to aim like you normally would on the computer. Or, you know, if the bullets actually hit. This isn't Fortnite or Warzone, so you can't snipe some bitch-ass punk from miles away. I don't know why, but you can't. Your bullets won't connect with a hunter if you're not at a certain distance. A shotgun is a shotgun, so that makes sense, but the pistols frustrate me to no end, because you have to be within inches of their face to get headshot. And by that point, you're already dead. Thankfully, there are blind spots that you can take advantage of to pick them off undetected, because you can only shoot like this if you're standing still. I can confirm that it's not all bad though. Mowing down rooms full of psychopaths and Cerberus guards alike is crazy fun, no matter the firearm. You really feel the impact that your bullets have when you shoot. In the latter half of the game, you get upgrades to the sawn off shotgun and the pistols in the form of the Spaz-12 and the assault rifle. Both of them pack a devastating punch, making quick work of anything that stands in your way. For 2003, it's pretty satisfying. You really feel the damage that your guns deal on your enemies, as they get staggered and blown back from any and 
all shells that you dump into their flesh. It's obviously outdated, but it definitely could be worse. No enemy in this game is a bullet sponge either, and neither are you, and I absolutely adore that about this game. I think it's more of the fact that the game designers had a hard-on for jamming a dozen enemies around every corner. They seemingly pop out of every fucking pixel on the screen to waste your ass. Fuck! Which is why I would recommend avoiding fist fights at all times, because the hand-to-hand -hand combat is choppy as a motherfucker. But of course, packing heat is not what got Manhunt to make the headlines. That's only a break from what you'll mostly be doing throughout your time in the director's playpens. Real name Lionel Starkweather. It's the brutal executions that are the face of this game, not holding back in their individual showcases. Sneaking up behind a hunter will cause the main protagonist, James Earl Cash, to stick his hand in the air. Then, the player holds down one of the action buttons buttons, depending on the console, and chooses when to let go of said button. The longer you hold down X or Square, for example, the more intense the execution will be. Yeah, as if this wasn't insane enough. Executions come in three different colors. White is hasty, yellow is violent, and red is gruesome. Each melee weapon has a unique kill cam for the three colors respectively, and they're not just for show, as white executions give you the least amount of style points, while red ones give you the most. Stack enough style points in a scene, and you'll be given up to three stars, or four if you're playing on hardcore. If you complete a scene within a specific time frame, which varies from one scene to another, you'll get a star for that as well. The game will then combine your stars for a final rating. Back to the executions, I'll talk about the stars later. Oh man, the tension these cause. When you've got multiple hunters in a stealth section watching every nook and cranny like a hawk, you can't help but be on the edge of your seat, even more so on hardcore difficulty, where hunters deal more damage and you have no minimap to comfort you. Fortunately, Cash has the holy grail at his disposal, darkness. Hiding in the shadows is essential to staying alive. You can safely stalk your prey throughout the scene without making a peep, and even throwing their rotting corpses in a dark place to prevent your detection. Speaking of sound, you can use that to your advantage and set up an easy kill. Whether it's by hitting the wall or throwing a goddamn severed head into the grass, nearby hunters will be alerted by any and all noises. They go to check it out, look around like an absolute dolt, then they get their shit pushed in. Preferably. If they lock eyes with you harder than Youngster Joey, they'll chase you to the end of the earth, and don't let them catch you, because the hand-to-hand -hand combat in this game is fucking awful. It is so choppy and unresponsive, half the time you'll just be punching the air or feasting on a knuckle sandwich. But this is where the major cheese comes in. If you manage to get out of a hunter's line of sight, which is not difficult to do, then you can safely enter a shady location, and poof, you've just completely disappeared like a fucking John Cena magic trick. Hunters are unable to see you if your icon is blue, even if you get all up in their grill. It's ridiculous, but that's what adds to the charm of oldies like Manhunt. A simple stealth system like this one may break immersion a bit, but at least it doesn't go too far in the other direction to the point where the game isn't fun to play. Managing the hunters is pretty easy once you get the basic movement down, since you can see whether or not a hunter is aggressive or not. If a hunter's icon is yellow, then that means they are idle. If it's orange, they're suspicious. And if it's red, they're screaming, BRING THAT ASS HERE, boy!" On top of that, the music will change depending on the hunter's condition, and I love it. The skin-crawling ambiance is dreadfully never-ending when the hunters are alerted and the various heart-pounding chase themes drown you in fear as you run away like a headless chicken for a shady place. Nothing showcases this dynamic better than the big bad of Manhunt, and trust me, we'll get to him later. I'd like to also give credit to Manhunt when it comes to saving your game. Throughout each level, you get a checkpoint of sorts in the form of a save state. You now have an opportunity to save your progress up to that point. If you die, you'll respawn wherever you last saved. I like this a lot, as you can't just save whenever you want, like in Bioshock, shock for example. The fact that you can save your game at any time completely trivializes the no Vita Chamber run. Not in Manhunt. If you want to save your game, you gotta fight for it. It means a shit ton of trial and error for you, but I would rather go through those trials and tribulations and lose a bit of progress if I die. I don't want to be able to stop time at will like Doctor Strange in order to set up an infinite cycle until I win. Being rated the maximum number of stars on a scene will unlock bonus features after beating the game. You'll get a piece of concept art for each scene, and on hardcore difficulty, every two scenes with five 
five stars will reveal a button combination that serves as cheat codes. Not only that, but for every five scenes that you achieve a max rating, you'll unlock a minigame. Most of them are surprisingly fun and add a boost in your quest for that oh-so-sweet platinum trophy. The first of the bunch is Hard as Nails, where the goal is to achieve the highest body count possible without dying. Hunters will spawn infinitely until you croak, and it's actually pretty difficult considering that you are only armed with a freaking nail gun. Glass shards and painkillers will appear every now and then, and you can shoot the propane tanks for an easy kill. You can also use the darkness to your advantage just like in the main game if you spot the opportunity for a stealth kill. The second minigame is Brawl Game, and I think it's definitely the worst of the bunch. You are placed on the basketball court from the Born Again scene, only having your bare fists to defend yourself and the occasional glass shard. In a poor man's attempt at recreating the Abyss Watchers boss fight from Dark Souls 3, hunters will not only fight you, but also each other. Like I said, the punching in this game is bad. But the thing is, it doesn't need to be good, because that's not what Manhunt is about. Sneaking around the shadows and picking off your targets one by one is the way you're meant to navigate the levels. So when you just throw a bunch of enemies in one place and say, fuck it, it doesn't work. Thankfully, there is a trick you can use for some grade A cheese to rack up those kills and get the trophy. You can actually clip through the fence and let the degenerates do the work for you. Thank God for that, because this minigame isn't fun in the slightest. I will never say the same about the last two, however. Monkey See, Monkey Die is hilarious and pretty addicting to learn. You start at at the end of Strapped for Cash and have to work your way backwards out of the zoo section of the scene. It's a great way to flip the game on its head. Monkeys pop out of every nook and cranny to murder your ass. Armed to the teeth with shotguns and machetes alike, they scream loudly and are constantly on the move. You really have to claw your way to the painkillers and get as many kills as you can in order to be stocked up on ammo. The only complaint I have with this one is that I wish it was longer, but maybe it would have overstayed its welcome, I don't know. It's a surprisingly good running gun for a game that was never known for its revolver clapping. The last of them is actually a cut level from the final game, Time to Die. It would have taken place between Road to Ruin and White Trash, with Cash making the Hoods gang run for the hills. Our leading man, equipped with nothing but a blackjack, has 10 minutes to kill all of them before their truck arrives. I love the aesthetic of this scene, with you patrolling the alley, jumping across the rooftops, and finally going all Leatherface in the garage. Speaking of horror movie villains, doesn't this ambiance make you feel like a certain someone? Fucking chills every single time. Although it would have been a perfect fit for the main story, I'm not entirely opposed to it being removed. Not only does the game have a comically long length as it is, but it would have taken away from the last mission in the game, as you don't see the chainsaw anywhere else but that mission. Regardless, I'm glad it was kept in, even as a bonus map. For a game that's 20 years old as of this video being posted, the gameplay didn't age as badly as I expected. Sure, the fist fighting is atrocious and the guns don't have that Call of Duty-like feel to them, but the basic loop that the game excels at never gets old. Picking off each hunter methodically with unchained ferocity and zero remorse is what makes Manhunt unlike any other game that I've ever played. Painkillers being limited and your only means of health replenishment makes every movement and bullet count. Combine the security of resources and ammo with the constant prowling and snarky personalities of the insane scum, and you've got one hell of a survivor horror classic. But what sets Manhunt apart from the typical titles that we see today is not just its gameplay, because the level design and soundtrack make you feel just as creeped out and disgusted with yourself and humanity. Okay, so I lied. We haven't quite wrapped this gig up. There's a double gate that leads on through to our next location. Find it. Even though the mechanics of Manhunt have not aged well with time, the things that are timeless are the level design and soundtrack. There's a whopping 20 scenes in this game, and every single one never fails to make you feel on edge or uneasy, like you're playing a game that you're not supposed to be. Whether it's because of the grungy, varied, claustrophobic level design, or the oppressive, sinister ambiance that slithers into your ear every step of the way, they start out pretty linear, then they branch out into more sandbox kind of levels. Some of them are strictly 
strictly stealth based, others are shooting galleries, and a few are a mix of both. The stealth oriented ones are obviously the better made levels, since that's really what Manhunt was made for, but the guns blazing scenes are also really fun, mostly because of how over the top ridiculous they are. It's like Manhunt took a note out of Max Payne's book. James Earl Cash is a one man army slaughtering dozens of psychos and cops alike, using the ammo of his fallen victims and conveniently placed painkillers to keep him going, but that doesn't mean they don't have their fair share of nonsense, because they most definitely do. View of Innocence is the first full-on, balls-to-the-wall, running gun scene in Manhunt, and it does not waste a second in raising the stakes. You take a trek from the bottom to the top of an abandoned mall, with Satanist Mexicans and pedophilic fat Americans blasting at your immortal Sigma flesh every step of the way. I love how you can use the various flower kiosks and the stores on the side of you to take cover and draw out the fuckboys, and believe me when I say that you need to use them, because they are everywhere. You can't just run through all willy-nilly like it's a Bay of Pigs mission from a Call of Duty campaign, unless you're a speedrunner. You gotta take your time for the most part and let the idiots come to you. Single file, orderly fashion fellas, the beginning of Kill the Rabbit is pretty similar, with the player being able to maneuver in and out of the rooms and jail cells through the tight corridors. This particular scene then expands into a massive open area where the player has a whole sniper fest with the Cerberus soldiers atop the guard tower. Nice. Some scenes like Border Patrol will open right from the get-go, with Cash being able to Marine Corps his way throughout Starkweather's foggy, morbid estate. But if you think that's creepy, just wait till you hear about the wrong side of the tracks. Your objective is to restore power to the subway, with CCPD and Cerberus troops hounding your every move, constantly patrolling the damn near pitch black tunnels. It's one of my favorite concepts in the game because of how tense it gets. Trained to kill, press coverage, and graveyard shift are more action-packed, putting the most emphasis on shooting your super soakers as much as possible. I like how you can turn on the generator in the beginning of press coverage to distract the cops. You can also use the walkway outside the first apartment room to catch the remaining piggies in the journalist's place off guard. <laughs> Speaking of her, you only have to escort her for a short time, thankfully. Once you retrieve the evidence at her apartment, the rest of the scene becomes a solo op. Trained to Kill has you kicking in the non-existent doors to the station, and then navigating the mess of a maze that is the train tracks. A myriad of weapons, ammo, and painkillers are hiding in every nook and cranny of this place, and I absolutely adore the fourth wall break at the end of the scene. It's one of my favorite moments in the game by far. Graveyard Shift is one scene that showcases the power of explosive tanks that you can use to your advantage. As you can see right now, I got a triple kill with just one click of the right bumper, and subsequently made Starkweather cream himself. Doing Time was originally my least favorite scene, not because of the stealth section at the start, which is actually one of the best parts of the game in my opinion, but more so due to the ending gun bonanza. I fully believe that this shit was impossible on my first playthrough, and I mean, Im fucking possible. I butt my head against this part for at least an hour trying to decipher the Hebrew, Polish, and fucking Confucius code that would sent me free. If they put more painkillers in the jail cells, it wouldn't be too much of a problem, but even still, you are outmanned and outgunned, and they all have pixel perfect aim too. You have to carefully shoot them one at a time and hope you don't get shot yourself, or you can cheese them from the ground floor, which I always do because fuck this Terminator roses in the shotgun box bullshit. Other hybrid scenes like Divided They Fall start out with some stealth, then explode into a massive shootout. Seriously, it's ridiculous how many war dogs that you pump lead into in this scene. Ramirez is really easy to press delete on, which I'm honestly glad about since getting to him is a massive pain in the cock on its own. Fighting your way up the abandoned building just to fight your way back down is always a headache. Mouth of Madness decides to start you out in the entrance of the Darkwoods Penitentiary, zapping a fucking schizo strapped into an electric chair. Fug proceeds to come play, and get his head wired off, then you traverse two more stealth sections in the courtyard before cleaning house. I love how you can sneak between the cover of the trees as the nutcases rant on about random shit. The gas tank makes a return from an earlier scene, with Cash using it to blow up a brick wall, somehow. You bully your way to the watchtower, where you cut off the pink dress dude's head to advance to the next scene. Shit. Key Personnel, the second to last scene, starts you off in the wine cellar, only to have you traverse through Starkweather's mansion to assassinate multiple Cerberus patrolling the halls. Interestingly, this is the only scene in the game that uses security cameras. You have to shoot them down to deactivate them, alerting the soldiers, but if you walk in their line of sight, 
reinforcements will always be called in. I don't know if it's just me, or is this scene fucking huge? You got the upstairs, the main floor, and the basement, all of them stretching longer than the goddamn Mississippi River. Manhunt really tries to go out with a bang at the end before the final scene, and I think it does a great job. The damn near two dozen rooms, heavily armed enemies, and the security cameras make for a dope final exam of sorts. Deliverance, on the other hand, has that hidden secret level vibe to it. For the sake of the story, I'm going to hold off on talking about this scene for now. It's my favorite scene in the game by a country mile, and I feel like I would do it more justice if I made things more dramatic and spooky. And of course, this is just the tip of the iceberg, because there's a whole nother gameplay dynamic in Manhunt that makes for a better experience in every way. Lurking around in the shadows is really where it's at. Born Again, Doorway into Hell, Road to Ruin, White Trash, Grounds for Assault, Strapped for Cash, and Drunk Driving are all mainly about systematically taking out each thug one by one. You journey all around Carcer City, starting off dashing through the city streets, then getting mugged and thrown into a junkyard, then get your frankenbeans kicked in again to have some fun in a fucking zoo. Starkweather really brought out the whole goddamn shithole, didn't he? Born Again is one of my favorite scenes due to it being the perfect intro and tutorial to get your foot in the door. Simple, yet memorable. Whether we are talking about the intro cutscene to set the stage, or Starkweather's comical commentary to lighten the mood through the first few kills that you're forced into. Doorway into Hell and Road to Ruin are more of the same, but the game also introduces hunter ambushes and setups as line calls them. You also make your way through more buildings in these two scenes compared to the first, where it's just the alleyways and streets that appear here. The nail gun makes its debut in White Trash, that you grab out of a stank-ass trailer where a skinhead neo-Nazi takes a shit inside. Did I mention that this game is way ahead of its time? Propane barrels also begin popping up from this point on, with Fueled by Hate having quite a few to blow the racist pieces of garbage into the next dimension. Speaking of said mission, you control not one, but two cranes that you have to use in order to move a refrigerator to progress into the scene, and you can drop it on them white supremacist bastards like their Looney Tunes characters. I'm not entirely upset that the crane or something like it didn't make a return, because it gives one scene its own unique identity instead of being repeated throughout the game unnecessarily. Grounds for assault and strapped for cash is when the war dogs come to play, and fittingly, they hunt you down like you're one of the animals in Carcer City Zoo. The tranquilizer rifle shows up for the first time, and it's fucking busted. It instantly stuns any and all enemies for a few seconds, giving you plenty of time to run or perform an execution. In Strapped for Cash, the war dogs capture Cash's family, and it's up to him to save them. Every time you get spotted, they'll blow one of their brains out, which ultimately doesn't matter, we'll get into that later. But I love how both of these scenes really make you feel like you're being tracked by a bunch of survivalist maniacs. Their design is pretty tight-knit, like a damn obstacle course, only with death! Just like Border Patrol, I love how Rockstar uses the short load distance of the game to their advantage by making it all foggy. At least that's what I think they did. But both scenes look really spooky since you can barely see most of the time. Drunk Driving is a full-on escort mission from beginning to end, and it's definitely my least favorite scene because of this. It honestly wouldn't be such an issue if the fucking tramp actually moved faster. Like, why does he have to dilly-dally behind you for a few seconds and then break out into a sprint? And it's a lazy sprint at that. Brody can barely keep up with me half the time, stumbling around and shit. I know he's a drunk, but still. At least you can give him wait and follow me commands a whole two years before Leon did it to Ashley in RE4. He'll hide in the nearest shady place, and you'll be telling him to stay put often, since he has his own health bar and will get his shit pushed in if spotted. And it's not like you can just book it for the exit either. Oh no, he's gotta be with you in order to progress in the level. It's not even that it's difficult, since you're obviously not going to sprint through the whole thing. It's more of the fact that it takes forever since you have to take on three devil worshippers in each stage of the scene at once. At least the end of the scene at the graveyard is an easy shootout section. You can leave the hobo at the gate and deal with the child touchers one-on-one -on -one with the strat. Even if the level design is good from a mechanical perspective, that's only one part of it. The music is the icing on this manhunt theme cake, and it never ceases to amaze me. Composed by Craig Connor, there's a tune for when you first load up the game, one for the main menu, one for all of the scenes in the game, including Time to Die, and two for the best of all, the credits. And off rip! The cyberpunk-esque intensity of the intro loading screen sets the tone in the best way possible. Then you get to the main menu and things begin to calm down, but remain nauseating. 
You can hear water dripping onto the floor in the background of the drowning, oppressive howling, almost as if you just got kidnapped by Jigsaw and are awaiting the TV to turn on. The tracks for each scene all have such a lingering dread to them, a mixture of loud clashing, vengeful whispers, and... Pigs? Okay, let me skip that last one for now. But selections like Fueled by Hate are some of my favorites that Manhunt has to offer. The long-winded whammy sounds at the start are later complemented perfectly by the tense-filled strings. Kill the Rabbit is also fantastic, featuring the quick rattling of drums and a sci-fi laser beam going in and out of your ear as you fight for the exit of the penitentiary. All of the songs are so fitting, as they really do sound as if you are murdering skinheads and going on a shooting spree where the insane are running the asylum. But for me, nothing can top the credits theme. The goddamn credits theme! Holy shit. It really does make me feel so fucking romantical. It perfectly encapsulates your triumph over all of the nightmarish challenges that the game threw at you. You finally came out victorious and are on top of the world. Then, in the second half of the credits theme, you're snapped back into reality and reminded of all the shit you just did and how the characters and the world around them will be affected by everything moving forward. I could go on for hours, but I think you get the point by now. Even if you are unable to play Manhunt, or just not interested in playing it, I highly encourage you to listen to the soundtrack on YouTube. You can most definitely listen to them on their own, but in my opinion, nothing beats hearing the sounds of the sinister oppression as you play the game. It does its job and it does it well. Aside from the music, I personally adore the look of Manhunt, not only for the raw, non-sugar-coated theme of the game itself, but also for the old-school, early 2000s video game vibe that these artifacts tended to have back in the day. I love how distinct each scene is from one another, and more so the look of each one. The gritty VHS aesthetic of the cameras and environments are so amazing, and really give that lost media kind of feel. Like when the sudden camera static when loading the next level or ending the current one, or when a cutscene plays to show enemies patrolling the world. It feeds into the idea that Starkweather is essentially the big brother of Underground Snuff, as he's always watching his actors to make sure they play their parts. Even the confirm and up and down commands on the main and pause menus give me goosebumps, and that's ironic, considering that all the goons you slaughter throughout the game are some of the goofiest motherfuckers on the face of the planet. Their constant back and forth banter and random gibberish will never not be hilarious. A party like this doesn't just plan itself, you know. That's not to say that their campiness is a bad thing, though. I think the ridiculousness of the thug's behavior adds to the charm from this absolute fossil of a video game. Like seriously, how the fuck did this game get criticized into oblivion by the media? I'm gonna take my time and give you a chance to run. Shit, this guy's a real dainty. Repeat playthroughs are just as enjoyable as the first, not only because you're more comfortable with the mechanics, but because the voice actors put in the finest of work back at the studio. And it's not just the enemies that are unbelievably funny. Cash's voice actor always sounds perpetually pissed off like a bootleg Rambo. Trust no one. Now go! Pull over! Pull over! Who are you? I've seen your face before. Keep talking. Who's Starkweather? Okay, let's go! To your apartment! Drive! Just shut up and stick with me if you want to stay alive. And the one for Starkweather nails the shitty, perverted piece of garbage that you'd expect from a sicko of his stature. Oh yeah, that's the stuff. That's my boy. Get your teeth into them. Beautiful. You're warming up our audience nicely. You're stacking those corpses up like it was Judgment Day. Looking at how each scene functions on a thematic level, I gotta say, there isn't one scene that feels video gamey. They all feel like real places that would actually exist and not over-exaggerated for gameplay's sake. And if that isn't enough to convince you, just look up at the sky. Look at that fucking sky. Look at the stars. Look at the moon! Which, by the way, Rockstar took straight out of GTA 3, and I love them for it. I don't give two shits about the graphics being dated, and that the characters only have one facial expression, because the gameplay and cultural significance is what gives a video game infinite longevity. Like, yeah, Cash, you pour that gasoline into the random box on the crane that's supposed to be the tank. You keep reacting to your family getting slaughtered with that straight shooter look. The look and feel of Manhunt is overflowing with charm and personality, and to top it all off, the story is one of my favorites in gaming. Okay, Cash, you perform brilliantly. Don't worry, I've got plenty more Wonderland fun lined up for you. <laughs> now, to finally get into the meat and potatoes of this cornerstone of gory video game art, the story and lore, 
Unlike what the media would have you believe, Manhunt has things of significance to say in its plot and characters. It may seem like it's mindlessly glorifying violence and murder to an outsider, but there is more to it than that. Pieces of shit like hatred are the games everyone should be criticizing the fuck out of. Your only objective in that trash is to kill anyone and anything you cross paths with, all to achieve the highest death count and score possible. And honestly, it wouldn't be a problem to me if the game didn't take itself so seriously. The Postal Frame franchise has just as much controversy surrounding it, if not more, but those Picasso pieces are so unbelievably goofy and self-aware. Manhunt is definitely far from the kind of game to make fun of itself, but that doesn't mean that it's an irredeemable act of terrorism or something. Allow me to break it all down, but before I do, I do want to stress that if you have any intention of playing the game yourself, I highly recommend that you do so before watching this part of the video. I really don't want to spoil this game for you, as I feel it's best experienced when you go in completely blind. Mind. But if you don't give a shit and don't mind spoilers like me, then it's on with the video. An unknown investigative journalist is reporting live on the execution of a notorious death row inmate, James Earl Cash. Supposedly put to death, Cash suddenly awakens, only to be greeted by a voice over the loudspeaker. Lionel Starkweather, who was once an acclaimed Vinewood film director before being blackballed from the industry, bribed the chief of police to sedate Cash instead of killing him. He plans to use Cash in his newest Manhunt snuff tape, instructing him to kill anyone and everyone in his way to ensure his own survival. Cash first comes to blows with the Hoods gang, one of many groups of twisted lowlives that Starkweather has hired. It becomes alarmingly obvious that this director has a large amount of power and influence to pull off an operation of this magnitude. And, you know, he's also a perverted greaseball. Cash has to take out his hunters methodically, stealing weapons from them and breaking obstacles like padlocks that halt his progress. Eventually making out of the Carcer Mark neighborhood, he gets kidnapped by a group of heavily armed mercenaries, the Cerberus, that belong to Starkweather. They strip Cash of his weapons and transport him to the next scene, the Denton City Junkyard. Here, he faces off against the Skins, a white supremacist neo-Nazi gang who's being controlled by Ramirez, one of Starkweather's old snuff stars. After clearing the junkyard of all the racist pricks, Cash gets kidnapped by the Cerberus again, only to be dropped off at the Carcer City Zoo. But the camera feed shows the player something real ominous beforehand, Cerberus feeding him some food. You can barely make out what that thing is, but it appears to be a man with the skin of an entire pig over his whole head. Maybe we'll run into him later. Cash has to outmaneuver the War Dogs, a gang led by Ramirez himself consisting of weapon-obsessed poachers and ex-military members. They really cement their persona in the player's mind and even more when they kidnap Cash's family and hold them hostage, blowing their brains out on the spot if they detect the director's leaning man. Regardless of how many you save, Starkweather has them killed anyway, as Cash makes a bunch of devil worship the Scullies, and child-touching man-kids, the Babyfaces, eat lead up and down an abandoned mall after he's out of the zoo. He throws the TV in a fit of rage, determined more than ever to take this mystery man down. Adding insult to injury, Starkweather forces Cash to babysit and escort a homeless dude to a graveyard, where he'll be taken by the Cerberus to his next house of horror. Well, more like a chemical plant, but still pretty horrifying. Starkweather gets more of his juicy, sweet snuff nectar here, and back at the Darkwoods Penitentiary, afterwards. The Smileys are the final gang on Starkweather's payroll that Cash butts heads with, being the most insane and unpredictable of the bunch. After looting and shooting his way to the guard room and through the cell blocks, Cash, being the fat, ugly Alice that he is, chases down the white rabbit that holds the key to escape the penitentiary. Starkweather's film reaches its end, with him planning to have Cash get shot to death by the last of the Smileys. But of course, it's no problem for Cash, not just because he was most likely a hired killer before being imprisoned, but also, oh, I don't know, having slaughtered dozens of people in shootouts already by this point in the game? Come on, Lionel. You thought this measly defense could stop anybody? Anyway, back on track. Cash blows the rabbit's head off, gets the key, and escapes the loony bin after fighting his way through Cerberus guards. He's quickly ambushed by Ramirez and the rest of the War Dogs, who have posted up in a giant hotel building. And somehow, they still don't have what it takes to kill Cash. He pumps one shotgun shell after another into the wilderness freaks, eventually catching up to Ramirez and disintegrating his head into mush. As Cash is running away, the reporter from the beginning of the game pulls up and helps him escape. They get to talking, and the journalist reveals that she has all the evidence necessary to ruin Starkweather's plans and reputation. Cash agrees to help her as they speed over to her apartment, only to be met with the CCPD. Starkweather orders
orders the chief of police, real name Gary Schaefer, to raid the journalist's place before she and Cash get there. Practically invulnerable at this point, Cash deletes them all like clockwork and parts with the journalist after she safely obtains her files. Cash proceeds to continue his mission alone. The police and SWAT team follow the leading man through the streets, the subway, and the train station. Having finally cornered Cash after all of this mayhem, the cops and SWAT are instantly shot by Cerberus. They take Cash back to Starkweather's estate, but are suddenly caught off guard by that thing we saw earlier. This gives your boy the perfect opportunity to find a way into Starkweather's mansion, and he does facing the might of the Cerberus team and their leader head-on. After snagging the key off their leader's corpse and restoring the power to the elevator from the basement, Cash is able to use it to travel to the top floor, but is attacked by Pigsy, the name of the thing I keep referring to. And thus, Cash has to find a way to kill Pigsy before he can get to Starkweather. And this is why I saved the final scene of Manhunt for this part of the video. Deliverance is my favorite scene in the game, and it's not difficult to see why. Let me start with Pigsy himself, who's every bit disgusting as he is shrouded in the mist of the unknown. Turns out, he was once a former and quite popular snuff star for Starkweather's films. But due to him being more and more enveloped in his rather psychotic pig persona, Starkweather locked him up and abandoned him in his attic. This is most likely out of fear of Pigsy escaping and exposing Starkweather's snuff film ring. But besides the mortifying backstory of this filthy brute, Pigsy stands out to me more for the fact that he's a dark reflection of Cash, what he would eventually become if swallowed by Starkweather's control. He'd be shackled, forgotten, locked in his captor's attic that looks like it has been rotting since the dawn of time for the rest of his days. Pigsy will randomly pop out at Cash to catch him off guard, chasing him endlessly. And this is why I also saved my commentary about the music for last, because it's the most sinister track yet. You can hear the revving of Pigsy's chainsaw with his childish squeals in the background as he's on your tail. The pounding heartbeat and drums filled me with so much dread as I'm forced to look at Pigsy's horrible appearance and caveman levels of behavior. Not to mention his massive swinging dick! Cash must use the darkness and the decrepit environment to his advantage, stabbing Pigsy in the back undetected. After getting the drop on him three times with two shards of glass and a wooden spike, Pigsy cuts the lock off the door to Starkweather to get away. Or so you thought. Yeah, even though you can clearly see him crouching as you walk in, this was a great scare for me on my first playthrough. With Pigsy's chainsaw roaring over his disturbing quotes, Cash lures him over the grate in the floor. Drawing out Pigsy again and getting him to walk over the grate will cause it to break, with Pigsy hanging on for dear life. Cash takes the chainsaw and brutally cuts off the sick fucker's arms, watching him fall to the basement floor below. God damn, what a villain. Cash is chased away from Starkweather's office by the last remaining Cerberus guards and heads back into Pigsy's attic to kill them. And in one of my favorite favorite moments from Manhunt, the player flips the script, and now you have taken Pigsy's place. The chainsaw revving and the pig squeals kick in as you hunt down the remaining Cerberus, butchering them like the snuff star that you've become. Supposedly, Cash was a seasoned hitman for hire outside of prison, but now after all of this, he's delved into even more deplorable territory. He's turned into the apex predator of Carcer City's corruption in a single night, making him even deadlier than Pigsy. You know, the one person that Starkweather was actually afraid of and thought would expose his plans? It's the perfect case of poetic justice to me. The one person that Starkweather thought would make for easy profit and the least threatening to his snuff film ring ends up shutting the entire operation down. Chef's kiss if I do say so myself. To wrap things up, Cash grabs the rifles from the fallen Cerberus to take out the other two by the door and finally, finally confronts Starkweather. The journalist from earlier is shown reporting Starkweather's death on the news, as well as bringing the snuff film ring he was running to light. She also mentions that the Carcer City Police Chief, Gary Schaefer, plans to plead not guilty to his connection to the ring. The game ends, and that sweet credits theme rolls. And then it's revealed that Manhunt was taped over a fucking kid's TV show! Holy shit! What a fucking journey this has been. Now, I can see why most people would be underwhelmed by that last cutscene, but I actually really enjoy it in the grander scheme of things. There's no happy ending for the reporter or Cash, nor is any real justice served after Starkweather's empire is exposed. It gets talked about by the masses, people are shocked, and then... 
life goes on as if nothing happened. Exactly like how our society functions. Well, maybe just America because the gun violence here is ridiculous. Because although the events of Manhunt are purely fictional, that doesn't mean that something like it could never happen. Most of the survival horror video games today, and even back then, always contained a death-defying escape from something, some supernatural entity or monster. In this game, the monster is us. Manhunt is such an accurate reflection of our own world, and thus, the entity that we as Cash are constantly running from is the darkness and evil of the human race. Criminals as dangerous as the war dogs, as repulsively perverted as the innocents, as psychotic and violent as the smileys are all very real types of people that we live amongst. Once acclaimed celebrities fall to the dark side of life and commit terrible atrocities like Starkweather, snuff films do exist and are sold for great financial gain. And Manhunt far from glorifies any of it. In fact, it does the opposite. They make you watch every detestable execution, every bullet that you fire so that you're grossed out by the end of it all. You feel sick to your stomach and question your actions and the world at large. Because, you know, you're a normal human being with a conscience. If you are one of those obsessive parasocial nutcases that can't differentiate between reality and fantasy, then what are you doing playing these kind of games for? You definitely need your dorsal nexus checked. Which you dear slim I wrote you but you still ain't calling head ass. So no, Manhunt is not as addictive as heroin that will turn you into a mindless killing machine, nor does the ending fall flat or the plot having nothing of value to say. It is a big middle finger to the boomers who don't understand video games, sure. Rockstar has always been known for that MO, but Manhunt is quite the commentary on how angry and disturbing the human psyche can get, and how people will stoop as low as they can for money and power. It's not afraid to take video games farther in the eyes of the general public, to go above and beyond in making an unforgettable survival horror experience in the medium. Speaking of which, the manual for Manhunt has quite a few interesting details to it. Immediately, you'll notice that the whole thing looks like an ad in some random corner of the dark web. Why aren't more video games doing these kind of things? You'll also see that Starkweather was under the company, Valiant Video Enterprises. But even more interestingly, it's not his business. It's actually owned by someone else. You'll notice a particular name you've never seen before in the game on the top right border of every page in the manual, or under Pigsy's greatest hits. Mr. Nasty. This is the real mastermind that's been pulling the strings in the Manhunt universe. He actually hired Starkweather to make snuff films for him after noticing how well they were doing on the black market. And you can even see more from Mr. Nasty on a fake website that Rockstar created after Manhunt was released. Holy fuck! How many game studios do you know put in this kind of effort into their newest project? And with that, I confidently rest my case. Manhunt 20 years later is nothing short of incredible. The gameplay loop is quite simple but effective, the atmosphere is eternally bone-chilling, and the story is more thought-provoking than you think. It's one of the few classics from the early 2000s that stands out as being so different from games of its kind at the time, and definitely today. I hold it atop my favorite video games list, and I wholeheartedly believe that it can stand with the goats of the medium. I really can't gush enough about it. The only thing that I really don't like about this game is that Rockstar squandered any and all potential they had when it came to the sequel. But that's one of many things I feel like Manhunt does so amazing. It's so good that it doesn't need a part two. But still, we don't talk about that one. Thanks for watching, and happy hunting!